Good afternoon and welcome to the Addressing Death with Dignity in Massachusetts webinar. My name is Brandi Brooks and aside from being the moderator this morning, I am a contract manager for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Program, the sponsors of today's webinar. Before I introduce our presenters, Ken Norton and Ann Douglas, I would like to go over a few housekeeping issues. First, to join the video portion of the webinar, go to www.readytalk.com and under participant, join a conference, enter 624-5494. On the next screen, you will be prompted to enter your name and email address and then click the green register for this meeting button. Second, to join the audio portion of today's webinar, please dial 1-866-740-1260 and enter the passcode 624-5494. Again, dial 1-866-740-1260 and enter the passcode 624-5494. Third, should anyone experience any technical difficulties with either the audio or video for this webinar, please dial 1-800-843-9166. Again, that's 1-800-843-9166, and a ReadyTalk representative will be more than happy to help. Lastly, all telephone lines are muted except mine, Ken, and Ann's. So please use the chat function located in the left corner to type in any questions you may have. Given the number of participants, Ken, Ann, and I will do our very best to answer as many questions as possible as we go along and at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let me introduce our presenters for this afternoon's webinar. Ken Norton and Ann Douglas. Ken Norton has been involved with the National Alliance on Mental Illness New Hampshire Chapter, or NAMI New Hampshire, for many years. In May 2011, he was appointed Executive Director by the Board of Directors. His previous role with the organization was as the Director of the Connect Suicide Prevention Project a designated national best practice program in suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. Ken has participated in the development of New Hampshire's state suicide prevention plan and was instrumental in the passage of legislation which established a suicide prevention council. Ken has more than 30 years experience in nonprofit agencies, most of it in various capacities within the mental health service delivery system. Our second presenter this afternoon is Ann Duckless. Ann brings over 20 years of experience in substance abuse prevention and treatment to the CONNECT project, which I mentioned earlier. Ann's varied professional work experiences include teaching at the high school and college levels, inpatient and outpatient counseling for substance abuse addictions, youth prevention community work at the statewide level, and a unique systems perspective in dealing with public health issues. Trained as a cultural competence trainer by the Anti-Defamation League, and embraces and promotes cultural sensitivity to issues of gender, race, ethnicity, language, religion, disability, and sexual orientation and identity. Uh, now that I've introduced both of our presenters. I would now like to go ahead and turn it over to them. So Ann and Ken, are you there? Yes, we are. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. So thank you all for participating, and I hope this will be um, an interesting discussion. We, we will not be opening the phone lines for conversation, but you can use the chat function on your, um, 
on your computer and feel free to engage us in chat at any, at any point in time with a question and we'll take them as we're rolling along. And I'd like to uh, start by just saying that this was a follow-up to a presentation that was held this past spring in May at the Massachusetts Suicide Prevention Conference. And I'd like to thank Alan Holmland and the Mass um, Department of Public Health for sponsoring this, um, this conversation. We have done a lot of work nationally and, uh, and with Massachusetts around the issue of suicide prevention and ethics. And, and some of that touched on some of the issues that we'll be touching on today when we, when we look at this issue of uh, physician-assisted suicide or death with dignity and the prescribing medication to end life ballot question that Massachusetts will be having. So this follows some of that and based on the work that we've done and the conversations that we've had, trainings that we've done in Massachusetts, um, the Mass Department of Public Health had asked us to facilitate this, uh, this webinar. So just a little bit at the outset to say too that I think as you all know that this is a ballot question that will be on uh, the ballot on November 6th and it is a binding referendum which means that if it passes it will go into effect. Um, signatures have been collected during the past year and validated to bring it to a ballot initiative and there's a certain percentage of, um, of signatures that needed to be collected and the legislature had a couple of points of time during that time when they could have brought a bill forward, but they chose to let it go to the ballot initiative. So that's where we get to today. Can, can I just ask, can if, um, hopefully everybody can hear us. I know one person was having difficulty hearing us, so hopefully our, our end of things, the volume is up loud enough. Um, so, um, and as Ken said, if, uh, if it is a yes vote um, in Massachusetts, then that will take effect on January 1st, 2013. And Ken and I, um, as well as your neighbors to the north here in New Hampshire, are very excited to see um, what the voters of, of Massachusetts will decide on this issue. So, are we ready to move forward? All right. So, um, all right. So we do have now. How come? I think it takes a second. Is it? Okay, on slide four. I guess I'll just say the slides as we go along, just so that we don't have any um, difficulties um, with the technology. Um, Certainly, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention want to uh, have this disclaimer about the fact that these, this information and the, and the varying perspectives that Ken and I will be speaking about um, do not, are not represented or endorsed in any manner uh, by these two entities. Certainly, this webinar is being held for the members of the larger Massachusetts community um, so that folks can have their uh, personal uh, voices and votes heard and registered and we wanted to inform uh, those voices and votes. Um, and NAMI New Hampshire also refrains from taking any position on this issue. We hope that this is a helpful webinar in terms of the various, um, various uh, places and research uh, that we have called for the content. Slide five is talking about the agenda. Um, Ken will be talking about historical perspectives that actually from way back in uh, philosopher times to uh, today um, and bringing us up to speed on all of the different historical figures uh, who have contributed to this discussion that we're having today on October 26, 2012. Um, and then he will also be talking about milestones um, with the same kind of perspective. Here we are in 2012, but a lot has happened over the years um, to get us to this point. Um, then we will talk about uh, very briefly ethics and death with dignity and some of the ethical principles um, certainly that clinicians, social workers, um, any kind of health care provider would be faced with um, in terms of this issue. 
Um, Ken will talk about the Oregon and Washington laws um, because those are the only two states currently in the United States uh, where death with dignity is um, legislatively enacted. And then I will talk about uh, the outline of Massachusetts Question 2, uh, prescribing medication to end life, what will be in front of Massachusetts residents in a couple of weeks. And then um, Ken and I will be talking about the pros and the cons and certainly enlisting your discussion on these points. Um, definitely our ground rules, and it's a little harder to enforce ground rules by technology, um, but we really do encourage all of us to have respect for the diverse opinions um, that folks have around this issue. It can be a very polarizing issue. It can be a very controversial issue based on uh, personal experiences, personal values, and professional expertise um, and ethics. So um, we recognize that and we respect that and we're hoping we can all abide by that. Um, as Ken earlier mentioned, uh, we don't have the option of phone lines Okay, we don't have the option of phone lines for um, today's webinar, but we really do encourage comments from you. We encourage questions from you, thoughts, reflective questions. Um, we do have some polling questions for you um, that we will be doing just to get a sense of, uh, so far 26 people have joined us and we want to get a sense of um, you know, what people uh, are in terms of their professional capacity. And then, um, and then presence of media, um, it, this is something we always like to ask in person at any suicide prevention um, function of this nature that we do, and we're not sure if any media are on. So if any media are on, we would certainly appreciate your um, letting us know via the chat box. And then um, in the interest of that respect for diverse opinions and experiences around this issue, we do ask that folks, um, that folks are gentle and that folks are respectful in their chat writings um, because that will help all of us uh, proceed forward um, in, in, a, in a good manner. Um, so the next, the next slide, slide, where am I, slide seven, is a slide that we would ask, um, we try to do this as interactive as possible, um, not a easy task to do, but we'd like folks to indicate whether you are an educator, a faith leader, a health care provider, a legal advocate, a mental health provider, a public health provider, a policy leader, a social services provider, a veteran service provider, or something else that is not listed. If every one of you would be able to check one of those circles um, so we can see what our membership thus far looks like on the webinar. And we'll just give you a, a few seconds to do that. 21 people have registered, 22, yeah, 23, okay. So, um, so feel free to jump in, Ken, if you want, but we have um, eight others, um, but then we have six social services providers and um, three mental health providers and, um, and then we have, policy, we have one policy leader on, that's awesome. And then we have um, a healthcare provider and two educators. Wonderful. Welcome all. So if, if folks that indicated an other wanted to, um, you know, indicate what, that, what field they represent or what profession what they represent, we can call them out to other folks. But again, you'd have to use your chat, chat box for that. Thank you. That's good. Oh, that is great. So there's about um, a bunch of people from the... Um, the Educational Development Corporation that are um, public health providers and technical assistance providers and educators. Uh, we have a researcher, person doing research and evaluation. Um, we have another person doing specifically suicide research. 
Um, we have an individual who is an educator in Wisconsin, uh, majoring in thanatology. Um, Which is the study of study of grief, death, and, and dying. Death, yeah. I think. Yep. Um, Correct us, Janet, if we're wrong on that. But we don't want to use words that people might not be familiar. Um, public policy um, folks, and uh, of course our good friends from the Merrimack Valley Samaritans, and as well as a, a crisis line supervisor um, involved in suicide prevention. Oh, and we have more. Oh, this is great. Oh, thank you for your chats. This is going to be quite exciting. <laughs> um, a NAMI family advocate, um, person who studied with Ed Schneidman, who um, was the founder of the American Association of Suicidology, um, public policy folks, um, social work student, and... Um, and Janet has let us know that thanatology is death, dying, bereavement, and all elements of death and dying. Thank you, folks. That, this is a wonderful slate of folks that are uh, with us, and uh, we hope to learn from one another as much as the information that Ken and I are going to share with you. So on um, slide eight, eh, it takes a while, I think. Maybe I need to get, okay. So slide eight, this is one more poll before we go on to um, our more didactic section, um, and we ask that you fill in your job setting. Assisted living nursing home, emergency crisis call center, we know from the chat uh, box that we have somebody, at least one person uh, from that setting, home health, hospice, uh, hospital or healthcare facility, mental health practice, and something else not listed above. And um, again, if folks want to, yeah, we have nonprofit agencies listed and um, universities. Thank you for that, Catherine. And um, statewide suicide prevention coalitions, that's great. Great, human services. Um, obviously, Ken and I, you may be asking yourself, well, why are they interested in job setting? Because we really wanted to know whether folks who are working in an assisted living uh, nursing home capacity or hospice would be on this call today um, uh, because this certainly, um, we're talking uh, about end of life issues here. So, so um, a couple folks from elder services, a, a lot of people from community based organizations, nonprofits, and uh, several folks from um, university settings as well. Great. Thank you. Keep those chats coming. It's like multitasking for, I don't know, I can't speak for Ken, but I can say it's multitasking for me, reading and talking at the same time. So now we're going on to slide nine, talking about terminology. So um, just want to acknowledge, you know, what we said before about respect for diverse opinions and that like other sensitive subjects, the language that we use can be very um, loaded or challenging, and so and and different sides um, take very polarizing views, and the language indicates your side or your preference. So we want to be clear that we're going to accept all language today: um, death with dignity, assisted suicide, physician assisted suicide, prescribing medication to end life. Um, or even euthanasia, although we want to be clear about the, the terminology for euthanasia, that, um, that it can really be in two forms. Euthanasia may be to benefit the individual um, or to the state, and it can be voluntary um, as well as involuntary. And for the purpose of our discussion today, we're going to assume that any use of that term is um, for an individual and um, under voluntary circumstances. Thank you, Ken. And the other thing I want to mention that Ken and I are seeing in the chat box, and I, I just want to say this as a note to Massachusetts residents on the call today, is there are a lot of people around the country who are looking at this initiative with interest. So I just want to say that I think this is an important initiative coming up in Massachusetts, not just for Massachusetts residents, but I think for um, the whole country as well as suicide prevention as a field. 
So going on to slide 10, uh, these are the three learning objectives that we hope to impart with you today. Um, Ken's really going to talk a lot about the historical perspectives in terms of um, certainly many of the uh, famous figures perhaps in the past uh, that had some contribution in some manner to this discussion, as well as milestones, historical milestones that those of us who have been around for a while will certainly um, recognize some of those major um, landmark events or rulings in the courts. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about the ethical concerns related to um, end-of-life issues. And whenever you're talking about death with dignity, um, we do believe that ethics comes into that. And um, with regard to the question two coming up in Massachusetts, prescribing medication to end life, uh, we want to talk about um, the experience that Oregon and Washington have had um, and how that may bear on um, the Massachusetts experience should they um, decide to pass this. So um, as, we, as we look at the historical perspectives, I'm going to read a few quotes from different people. But I think that part of the reason that we include this, and a lot of, a lot of folks um, were sort of like, well, let's get right to the heart. Let's talk about what's happening in Massachusetts. But I think that it's really important to understand the context of how we got to where we are, and um, both historically and in more modern times. And, and that's why it's important. And, I would start by saying that you know, Socrates, um, who was uh, given the option of exile or suicide after he was convicted essentially of treason, he, he said, and he, Socrates lived um, between 469 and 399 BC, he said, the hour of departure has arrived and we go our ways, I to die and you to live, which is better, God only knows. And in many ways, that raises some of the, the, the context of suicide in general and life and death in general as a question, which comes up when we're talking about individuals who are terminally ill. Um, Plato, a little bit later, um, 50 years later, said, and, and this is a very graphic quote, the, the God of healing did not want to lengthen out good-for-nothing lives. Those who are diseased in their bodies, physicians, will leave to die, and the corrupt and incurable souls, they will put an end to themselves. So even you know, um, before the birth of Christ, people were talking about these issues and the challenges of people with severe medical conditions um, in terms of whether they should live or die. Nietzsche, who um, lived in the uh, mid-1800s to the 1900s, said, the invalid is a parasite on society. In a certain state, it is indecent to go on living, to vegetate on in cowardly dependence on physicians and medicaments after the meaning of life, the right to life, has been lost, ought to entail the profound contempt of society. So can you kind of summarize that, Ken, that saying so, that I mean, Nietzsche just said? Essentially, again, you know, that it's um, really almost contemptuous of people that, um, that are gravely ill and that... Um, essentially saying that they're a drain to society and that they should not continue to live and that the physician's resources should, should go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Edward Schneidman, who we mentioned, and, and we have one person who studied for many years under Schneidman, said that suicide prevention is like fire prevention. It's not the main mission of any institution, but it is the minimum ever present responsibility of each professional and when the minimal signs of possible fire or suicide are seen, then there are no excuses for holding back on life-saving measures. Um, I'm sure that um, Schneid would, would be very happy if he were still alive to see that there are some folks um, and some organizations represented on this call whose mission is around exclusively around suicide prevention. But the point is that Schneidman felt that it's something that we all do in society, that you know, the importance of, of life and helping to preserve life and prevent suicide is a shared responsibility. Thomas Sass, who many of you may know, um, who died very recently, a couple months ago, um, and who was a psychiatrist who pioneered 
um, some very different thinking about um, individuals and during the 60s and sort of that whole um, reflection of the times that we live in, SAS said suicide is a fundamental right. This does not mean that it's morally desirable. It only means that society does not have the moral right to interfere. So, I mean, again, a, a very profound sort of bookend from Schneidman, who's saying that, you know, as a society that, you know, that we should do everything in our power to prevent suicide. Um, Sad saying that we might not like suicide or believe that it's okay, but we have no, as a society, we have no right to interfere. And you can see in that historical perspective picture, that is the fatal freedom. So um, Dr. Kevorkian said, um, and I think we're all familiar with Kevorkian who was you know, convicted at one point of being a physician who had assisted suicide, and really in many ways some very complicated um, issues that he raised because he dealt with terminally ill people but then also dealt with people that, that weren't terminally ill um, but maybe were in pain or wanted to die, and that raised some very challenging issues for us as a society and the states in which he operated in and their laws. Um, Kevorkian said um, in 1994, if you don't have liberty and self-determination, you've got nothing. That's what this country is built on, and this is the ultimate self-determination. When you determine how and when you're going to die when you're suffering. So um, very important sort of perspective, and, and many of these issues really came into the forefront for us as a society um, as a result of uh, Dr. Kevorkian and his very high profile um, engagement around this issue. I also think that um, Dr. Kevorkian, Dr. Kevorkian's work in this area, I think that um, that also uh, for, for many people that is part of the controversy of this area because during those times uh, there was a lot of legal um, uh, work about getting Kevorkian and uh, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of people who were very opinionated one way or the other about whether his practices should continue or should be disbanded. And um, I think that during those late 90s when um, this was happening, I think that that uh, really added uh, a great controversy to this issue. Uh, not good, bad, or indifferent. It just added controversy to this issue because it certainly put the issue front and center for all of us um, as Americans. So we have a, a couple Schneidman fans. Our, um, our person that has studied under Schneidman indicated that they have a, uh, hopefully a paper forthcoming about Schneidman's theory of psychological pain and applying it to the issue of physician-assisted suicide. And we have another participant who's really excited that there's um, a student of Ed Schneidman on the call. So. Um, uh, ben Okri is a Nigerian um, poet and writer, and uh, he's living, was born in 1959, and he said that the most authentic thing about us is our capacity to create, to overcome, to endure, to transform, to love, and to be greater than our suffering. And, you know, for many folks, particularly in the, in the Christian tradition, suffering is an important part of who we are as people. Um, and obviously uh, the experience that Christ had of suffering on the cross. And then Pope John Paul II said, a man, even if seriously sick or prevented in the exercise of his higher functioning, is and will always be a man. He will never become a vegetable or an animal, the Pope said. The intrinsic value and personal dignity of every human being does not change depending on their circumstances. And that, um, that was in 2004. And remember that during some of these times, there were important cases, and we'll, we'll talk about them, um, for people that were determined to be brain dead um, and families had petitioned courts to um, mm -hmm. take them off life support. Anything else you want to say about these historical perspectives, Ken? No. No? OK. So if anyone has any kinds of comments or questions, Please um, chat them in. Um, we're going to go on um, approaching the milestones. So um, <clears throat> the, 
the whole uh, discussion around um, death with dignity or physician-assisted suicide would be incomplete without acknowledging the important aspects about culture and, re and religion as well as suicide. And, you know, the, um, these are very complex and they vary from culture to culture and, from, and even within religious traditions there are some different interpretations. But essentially, um, they're, they're, for many religions and historically, they believe that it was a moral imperative to protect life and that um, the sanctity of life, only God has control of a human life. And particularly within the Judeo-Christian heritage, um, suicide was historically looked at as a sin. On the other hand, um, some cultures actively practice genocide, where um, uh, people who were uh, older and becoming incapacitated would, um, would essentially end their own life or they would be killed. And the example of that which is um, familiar to us is with um, Inuit elders left to die, although, you know, this appears to be somewhat controversial while it happened. There's some things that I've read that said that it happened very infrequently, um, but it is, it is one of those examples. Certainly other examples we see about honorable self-inflicted death are, are Harry Carey and suicide bombers um, in, you know, in interpretations of the Muslim uh, religion and in martyrdom. So, um, very important to think about those impacts of culture and religion and how they inform some of our beliefs about suicide and end-of-life issues. And also, I would add that this is also where uh, personal values come in um, at, to a great extent, and that's why there can be such a vigorous debate around this issue. Okay, go going on to the Hippocratic Oath, slide 13. So, um, one of the things that's very important um, is that, um, that the Hippocratic Oath came from the time of Plato and, um, and Socrates. And there's a, a piece of it that says, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I am asked, nor will I advise such a plan. And similarly, I will not give a woman a, a pessary to cause an abortion. And that's the, the quote. Now, um, it was written in, in ancient Greece times um, before Christ. It's been modified continuously over the years since that time, although this particular aspect of it has remained in some form or another. And one of the things that's very interesting that, that I learned in, in, in researching this is that most doctors do not take the Hippocratic Oath. Um, they, they may take some form of an oath, um, but different schools practice different pieces or some don't use it at all. So it's, you know, one of the arguments that we often hear is that it's a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. There may be doctors that took the Hippocratic Oath and, you know, certainly feel strongly about that, but it's not something that is universal to all doctors as we um, tend to think. And now going on to some of those milestones, and I think there are 15 or 16 listed here, and I'm sure many of us will recognize a number of them. So, you know, one of the things that's, that's really important to, um, to talk about when we're talking about the modern milestones is to identify that these are um, post-World War II and the Nazi era. And the Nazis um, took euthanasia and um, killing and genocide to extreme levels that society has never seen before. And uh, while we're certainly familiar with the, with the killing of uh, Jews, all kinds of different people were killed, um, gypsies, homosexuals, all kinds of different groups um, that were perhaps um, marginalized by society. All kinds of medical experimentation was done um, on folks and on children. And so, while these conversations or discussions or thinking about um, death and suicide and end-of-life issues had been evolving, I think the horror of what the world experienced in the post-Nazi era really kind of put, um, put an end to that discussion for a period of time. And so um, the discussion seemed to pick up again in the 
1960s. And in 1967, we have the first living will written in Indiana. And that was um, followed in 1968 by uh, a journal article in a medical journal that, um, that first used the term irre irreversible coma and suggested that, um, you know, that it might be a criterion for, for death in this medical journal. In 1973, the American Hospital Association, and this was a huge uh, turning point, adopted rules allowing patients to refuse treatment. Um, up until that point in time, um, patients that wanted to stop eating or refusing treatment were often forcibly treated. And in 1976, we would all probably be quite familiar with the case of Karen Ann Quinlan, um, where the, the New Jersey Supreme Court allowed her to be disconnected from life support. So Karen Ann Quinlan was somebody who was um, in a coma and who was registering no brain activity for a number of years and whose family said that she would not want to live this way and asked to have her um, life support dis discontinued. And if people remember the Karen Quinlan case, that was a highly controversial issue in the nation because even family members among themselves were torn about whether to take her off or keep her on that life support. So that really fueled this fire, this issue. And then um, same year, California allowed the withdrawal of life-sustaining medical treatment when death was imminent. And so, you know, really in a very condensed period of time there, a three-year period of time between when the American Hospital Association allowed people to refuse treatment and when um, California allowed um, the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment to be, uh, to be okay. So that was followed by, um, in 1980, the Hemlock Society was formed. And the Hemlock Society is a society that um, promotes the right to, um, to die by suicide. And then in, um, also in 1980, Pope John Paul um, put out a declaration on euthanasia and, and the church's stance on that, essentially opposing it and talking about um, the sanctity of life. In 1986, the Universalist Unitarian Church issued a right to die with dignity. Um, so again, in a very short period of time, two churches with very opposing views and the UU Church saying that people should have the right to, um, to determine their death and to die with dignity. In 1990, uh, Dr. Kevorkian um, and his first assisted suicide, and then followed in 1994 by Oregon passing their uh, death with dignity law. And then in 2000, the, the Netherlands legalized euthanasia, and again, a very challenging piece because that euthanasia under the Netherlands was both voluntary and involuntary. And then in 2006, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Oregon law. And I also want to point out that, um, just in case people don't know, the Hemlock Society's current name is End of Life Choices. Okay, so we have five polling questions that we weren't able to put on one slide, so we have one polling question per slide for folks. Um, have you ever assisted a client or family member in establishing a living will? And if you could check yes or no, um, that would help us know in terms of, again, our participants and what kind of experience we all bring to this issue. And we're about split. We're, we, we are. We're just about split here. Uh, we have um, half that have indicated that yes, they have assisted in a living will, and no, they have not. Thank you. Oh, sugar, that has a, a graph. Do people see that graph? Oh, that's great. Okay. All right, next slide, slide 16. Have you ever assisted a client or family member in developing a DNR order or a do not resuscitate order? Have you ever assisted a client or family member with a DNR order? A greater proportion of us um, have not assisted. 
Um, and that, I think it comes out automatically, I think. Does it? Yeah, oh, I think she told me. Okay, there we are. So a greater proportion of us, while we were split with the living will, a greater proportion of us have not been involved with a DNR order. Do you personally have a living will? Do you personally have a living will? Because I'll tell you, these issues are certainly touched on for all of us. And the survey would show that most of us, double of, uh, double of us, do not have a living will. Skip to results. There we go. There we go. Okay, one out of two uh, do not have a living will. Oh, next. Sorry. Okay, the next question, um, two more. This is the next to last. Have you been directly involved, either personally or professionally? And if you click on that question with your icon, the whole question will come up. Uh, in the removal of life support or withholding medical treatment or nourishment. Have you been directly involved, either personally or professionally, in the removal of life support or withholding medical treatment or nourishment? And again, uh, the majority of us have not been involved in that kind of um, decision or situation. So our, again, we're, what Ken and I are pointing out here is that um, our life experiences um, certainly add to our perspectives on this issue. And then the last polling, whoops, there I am, sugar. Oh, I guess we did get through all the polling questions. Okay, so there we are, Ken. So um, currently, two states have, um, have a, assisted suicide. Hold and, on, hold um, on. Physician-assisted suicide or death with dignity. Oh, and, there we go, okay. Um, those are Washington and Oregon. And um, as I mentioned before, Oregon um, passed in, in 1994. Um, one other state, Montana's Supreme Court, ruled that physician-assisted suicide is not against public policy, but um, to this point in time, they have not gone through and formally allowed physician-assisted um, suicide. And that, re that means that the other 47 states, and, and there have been numerous other legislation attempts in other states, and even ballot initiatives in other states, but all those other states have some type of law prohibiting assisting someone in the ending of his or her life. And New Hampshire has this on the books as well. And this law on slide 20, uh, yep, there it is, uh, is the Massachusetts General Laws, Part 2, Title 2, Chapter 201D, Section 12, and it's listed as suicide or mercy killing. Nothing in this chapter shall be construed to constitute, condone, authorize, or approve suicide or mercy killing, or to permit any affirmative or deliberate act to end one's own life other than to permit the natural process of dying. And we put in the uh, website on that slide below. On slide 21, uh, we ask folks for one more polling question. Are you currently involved in some aspect of suicide prevention work? Yes or no? And my guess is a preponderance of us on the call are involved in suicide prevention work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. On slide 22, um, these are the three principles for ethical decision making that really come into play uh, whenever a, an ethical dilemma is being faced by a clinician or any other professional. Um, the do no harm, uh, where we're always trying to minimize or prevent harm. Uh, first, do not be silent, which was from Socrates. And then do good, where we are trying to do the greatest good possible. You want to say anything? Sure. Else? So, I mean, we're not going to spend a lot of time um, getting into ethical pieces here. We will talk about a couple of other ethical components. But I think one of the things that's important for people to recognize um, under these maxims is um, who, in, in whose opinion is it? Because do no harm from the doctor's perspective may be very different from the patient's perspective, or doing good 
from, you know, from those different perspectives or from the family perspective. So, um, so they're not really hard and fast, and, um, and that's something that I think is really important to think about as we move forward. And um, Julie, thank you for pointing out that um, even though a preponderance of our listeners today and participants are, um, are working in the field of suicide prevention, there are others who are not, and we thank you for joining us as well. And again, anytime you need, uh, you'd like us to um, uh, recognize you for a comment or a question, please text it to us. So the next slide is talking about the related ethical components to the three principles that we just talked about. Um, and these certainly come into play with question two uh, and any Death with Dignity Act. The dignity and worth of the person, um, the self-determination of the individual, and certainly informed consent. And, um, Ken will be covering this in the Oregon and Washington laws, but certainly the Massachusetts question too has really uh, quite clearly covered uh, the issue of informed consent um, and self-determination. So the other thing that's important to consider with this is that um, each of these um, really has several, um, several dynamics involved in terms of um, they can be from the perspective of the uh, the physician or the healthcare provider, or they can be from the, the perspective of the, of the um, patient involved. So um, again, whose opinion are we asking about dignity and worth of the person? And how do we, um, how do we reflect on self-determination? And, and what about informed consent? And as Ann said, some of that is very clearly specified in these uh, different aspects of the law. Um, but they are important considerations and would certainly reflect that people that are part of a professional association or have um, a licensure that you may have um, things in your code of ethics that specifically refer to instances of self-determination. I would say, for instance, for my, or you know, dignity and worth, that all three of these are covered in my code of ethics as a social worker, and you know, and, and would point out that particularly in the area of self-determination, that the um, that the code of ethics. For social workers, it goes up and to the point of where there might be imminent harm involved to the person or to somebody else. Slide 24 is a quote from Anthony Salvatore, which uh, is about clinicians equating what's legal with what's ethical. And in most cases, the law sets only minimum standards of conduct, and ethics demands more. And so we put that in here because we really do want people to keep in mind um, that what is ethical may not be legal, vice versa, um, but just to keep in mind um, the power of legislation and the power of ethics. Anything you want to say on that? No, I, I, th I think that this is just something that oftentimes gets misunderstood or misinterpreted, and particularly because of the power of the courts and the power of law um, but we should never lose sight of what ethical standards may be. So Ken's going to get into talking about the Oregon and the Washington criteria now. So as I mentioned before, in 1994, Oregon was the first state to develop an assisted suicide or death with dignity law. And the requirements of that law are that the person be 18 years of age or older, that they be a resident of the state of Oregon, that they be capable, meaning that they can, are able to make and communicate healthcare decisions, and they have to be diagnosed with a terminal illness that will lead to death within six months. And the criteria for Washington State um, is very similar, and that was signed into law in um, 2008. Next slide. So among the Oregon suicide deaths, and, and this um, may not be current, this was um, you know, current as of the beginning of the year, um, but 92% reported um, a decreasing ability to participate in activities that made life enjoyable. 87% reported a loss of autonomy. 78% reported a loss of dignity. 80% were believed to have, to have cancer. 
78% were between the ages of 55 and 84 with a median age of 72 years. And 98% uh, were white, 60% um, were well educated, and almost all had health insurance. And, you know, and, and those are important criteria because a, one of the things that was in Oregon, a couple of the arguments that were made very strongly in opposition to this law was that it would um, discriminate against people with low income and, um, and people without um, health insurance or means. And what we've seen is that, in fact, that um, those, are, those are the people who are more often choosing the option are the people who are uh, well-educated and the people who have health insurance. Do you, um, Oregon, we have a question about Oregon uh, requiring an evaluation by a psychiatrist. I, I don't believe so, although I believe that it does say that the physician has to certify that the person is competent to make health care decisions. And that that, um, that evaluation would probably take place um, if there was any kind of um, belief that a psychiatric or a psychological um, impairment might be uh, affecting that ability. So, um, and again, this is, um, this is not uh, current, but was current through the end of 2011. Um, and I think that this is very informative in that the, what we've seen in Oregon and to some extent less so in Washington, is that a number of people, particularly in the early years, um, went and saw a physician and were given prescriptions um, of life-ending medications, but they chose not to um, go that route. And so the, the number is uh, of people that actually died by suicide using the medications they had received is much smaller. Um, that number does seem to be growing a little bit. And and I think that some of it is that as a society it is um, more acceptable or people are understanding it differently than they understood it before, um, but it is an important aspect. And, and I think some of the more recent numbers that I've seen out of Washington from last year indicate a, a much higher percentage of people that are um, seeking out the prescription and then, um, and then utilizing it. And part of that might be because people are living longer lives as well, and medical medical improvements are being are are coming along. So that I, I'm sure the impact of medicine over the years has certainly impacted that as well. And I, I think that you know one of the things that's really key here is that we're talking about self determination, and you know and and one of the reasons that I think the number for the prescriptions is higher than the self-inflicted death is that that is, you know, the person taking um, the self-determination to choose and take control of um, how and when they want to die to at least have the option. And I think um, we have a quote that, that elucidates that a little bit. Having the choice gives me comfort. Just knowing there's an option, knowing that there's a choice. This has taken the fear out of dying for me. And this was um, an Oregon resident with breast cancer who did not take his life uh, or who did not take her life um, and had that uh, uh, death with dignity option. And we also have a message um, from, um, from Catherine stating that only one of 71 Oregon Death with Dignity Act patients who died during 2011 was referred for formal psychiatric or psychological evaluation. I know that question came up, um, so the majority of individuals are not referred for that consultation. Thank you, Catherine. So now we have four different arguments. Um, some are in favor of and some are opposed to um, uh, with, with what Ken has just covered. Prior to us going into the, um, the, the, the guidelines as outlined for Massachusetts question two. And these are the four considerations for pain and suffering, economic considerations, self-determination, which Ken just alluded to earlier, and then certainly on the other side of the fence that this would be a slippery slope to legalize murder. 
So, and there may be other arguments that people um, want to raise, and we can discuss them, but these are the ones most, most commonly raised, so I'm going to put them out there. But um, in terms of pain and suffering, um, on the one side, um, people say that, um, that, that it's inhuman to allow an individual in pain to suffer for a prolonged period of time. And, and on the other side, people say, well, you know, things are really very different now with modern medicine and that palliative care has made great strides in reducing pain and suffering during an individual's final days. So those are sort of the, the both sides of that argument about, um, about pain and suffering. In terms of economic considerations, um, uh, on the one hand, people say that physician-assisted suicide will be based on economic factors and access to care issues. And, um, and as part of that, um, we know, there, and there are, different, there are different levels that, um, you know, that have been stated or different parts that, um, in terms of what some of these numbers are, but one of the estimates is that 40% of Medicaid dollars are spent in the last two months of someone's life. And, so, you know, this is where we get some of the talk about, um, about uh, death panels and those kinds of things. What we know from, um, from, uh, from Oregon is that almost all death with dignity cases had health insurance. And there are already profound economic disparities in health care in the U.S. And um, one of the arg other arguments around that is that if we were spending um, the money in the final days of life that we spent on, you know, instead of spending it on people's final days, if we spent it on prenatal care, um, that we would uh, be doing a huge uh, benefit to people because of the poor prenatal care and the subsequent medical conditions that people live with for the rest of their lives, so, or even infant mortality. So those are some of the arguments around that, um, the economic consideration piece. And then um, in terms of um, self-determination, we know that, um, as we've talked about already, that individual freedom to determine when and where to die is a big, uh, big part of the argument for, um, for death with dignity. But on the other side are religious or you know, moral or even ethical beliefs that, um, that, that really that it's interfering with God's will and that um, as humans that we don't have the um, and shouldn't be interfering with God's will, that the sanctity of life of when people die is something that only God determines. So that's, that's another consideration. Um, in terms of the slippery slope to legalize murder, um, the arguments around that is once the government sanctions killing of any kind, that we really enter into dangerous territory where the state may determine the elderly or individuals with severe disabilities or others should be euthanized. And part of the power of this argument comes from some of those cases in the Netherlands, which I mentioned and, and won't go into um, a lot of discussion about that, but where to say there has not been a, a clear delineation around voluntary um, physician-assisted suicide or death with dignity. Um, but again, the lesson I think learned in Oregon is that legalizing suicides for terminally ill individuals can be successfully structured and restricted so that it has no impact on all the other vulnerable populations. So in other words, there's been no evidence in Oregon or Washington that, um, or no movement that it should be expanded beyond this piece of voluntary self-determination. And Ken, we have a question from Gavin um, asking, um, did you say that the majority of Medicaid money is used in the last two years of life? Can no, you it was, it was 40 percent, up to 40 percent um, is used in the last two months of life. So, um, and there's different, you know, there's different figures we see in the last 10 days, whatever, but, you know, certainly we go to, and I think anybody that has been through this with a family member or loved one sees that even when it's very clear that the person's days are very numbered, that all kinds of um, extraordinary medical tests may be ordered. Um, I know that I can personally speak with my mother-in-law where, you know, um, they wanted to, to ship her to another hospital to do an MRI um, three days before she died, and, um, and she said no. Um, so 
I mean, I think that that's a consideration for, you know, for people is, um, is around some of those economic pieces and how much money are, is spent in the um, final days of life versus how much money is spent around prenatal or, you know, or preventative care in the early stages of life. And Janet, who studied under Edwin Schneidman, we do have people who are looking forward to seeing the paper that you will be coming out with in terms of um, the, his theory of psychological pain with physician-assisted suicide. So people are interested in that. So the next question, anything else on that, Ken? No. Okay. So the next question, uh, we have three more polling questions before I get into uh, the specifics of question number two um, for Massachusetts. The first is, are you currently working with patients who have terminal illness? Yes or no? And so we have, so we have, um, uh, a, a majority of us who do not work with uh, patients with terminal illness. And again, in that chat box, we would love to hear from folks whose professional experience uh, especially uh, lends itself to this discussion and to whether this bill gets passed or not. Um, so thank you for that. The next question is, do you routinely come into contact with people who have terminal illness as part of your work? And um, yes or no. And that might sound like the same, but uh, it might be something different depending on people's relationship with patients or with clients. Just giving people a little bit of time to weigh in there. And again, uh, the majority of us, 80% almost, do not have uh, this type of contact. But again, we'd like to encourage um, folks to uh, chat us um, with this experience. And then the last piece before we get into the Massachusetts, uh, present, uh, Massachusetts question two, have you cared or are you currently caring for a family member in his or her end stages of life? And we're seeing a much greater affirmative response to this, which again adds adds to this discussion. So we're seeing that 65 of us, 65% uh, of us have this kind of experience or are currently experiencing it versus 35% of us who do not. Are we all set to go? Okay, so uh, Massachusetts question two, um, if you've looked at the uh, legislation as it's out, uh, outlined, you will see that it's voluntary um, on the part of the individual, on the part of the physician, for the health care providers affiliated with this, and health care facilities involved. The person must be a resident of Massachusetts. I must say, when I read this, it had a lot of similarities to the Oregon law that Ken just covered. Uh, although it is, co it is, uh, it is uh, entitled differently, um, as prescribing medication to end life. Must have an illness which will cause death within six months. That's also comparable to the Oregon law. Must have capacity to make own health care decisions and must self-administer medications. So meaning the person themselves must be the one to give themselves that prescribed medication. Anything else on this, Ken? The continued part of this that the request must be made orally and in writing, um, that there must be two witnesses to this request, and one has to be what is labeled as non-heir, H-E-I-R, non-family, a non-family member. So um, hopefully this, this aspect really gets at um, any kind of abuses that might take place um, because of uh, family estates and wealth and such. Um, the individual must be examined and give informed consent by or to a physician. Um, and for the oral request, um, there is a wait of 15 days. So we're talking some 
some planning here on the part of the person and the um, healthcare individuals assisting that person. Um, so uh, 15 days um, um, uh, wait and then 48 hours wait for the written request. Um, this person is encouraged to notify next of kin and the death certificate will list the underlying illness of this person who is requesting this. Do you so one of the questions that we've received is um, how would this affect temporary residents or illegal immigrants? And you know it's it's a great question, and we're not really clear around that. Um, but the intention of the law is that obviously, and and I think following the other laws is that they don't want folks from other states traveling to Massachusetts for the purpose of um, ending their life and. You know, and, and I'm assuming that, that the physician would be the one that kind of makes that determination. I don't know that there's going to be, you know, a criteria. I'm sure that there would need to be a street address or whatever other kinds of things are tracking them. But, you know, if, if, a, if a physician uh, or a healthcare provider doesn't have an existing relationship with, um, with somebody and then they're approached, they may say that they don't um, want to be involved and to do that. What if the person cannot write, Ken? Um, if the person cannot write, I think that there's a provision in the law that allows them to direct someone else to, um, to put it in writing on their behalf and, um, and then to have that submitted. But I think that the uh, physician has to, you know, has to hear them saying that and, and has to be a part of that process. And how will this impact life insurance policies as far as payout since this is a state law and not a federal mandate? So the, um, you know, the, given that the criteria is that the de death certificate would not say suicide, there doesn't seem to be uh, um, any way that it would impact on life insurance policies. Most life insurance policies uh, have a time limit around uh, suicide, so it's not it's not an unlimited thing. Um, it may be for the first year of the policy or sometimes for the first two years of the policy. So in other words, they want to protect themselves against somebody who may think that uh, they're going to end their life and they take out a huge insurance policy and then a month later um, die by suicide. So uh, presuming that for the most part that um, insurance policies wouldn't be affected by that, and I don't know what type of documentation would go into a medical record and whether insurance companies might seek that out and, you know, and then raise an issue around payment. I'm not familiar with that occurring in either Oregon or Washington State, but it is a good question. And I'm sure if there's uh, a different language spoken that it would uh, be in that language, in that translation, in that notarization? Sure. I mean, it would, you know, again, assuming that it would involve um, medical translators who are certified or experienced as um, in that area and probably not, you know, through a family member or somebody else. So, right. um, you know, whatever types of uh, key translators would be used in a medical setting would be uh, sufficient. Okay, so keep those chats coming, folks. We have only a few more slides. Um, this one is um, related to a polling question we just asked. I'm, I'm on slide 35. And this is comparison with generally accepted current medical practices. Um, certainly do not resuscitate orders, removal from life support, uh, withholding nourishment or medical treatment, and pain medications given by doctors such as the palliative care that Ken talked about? So, you know, essentially, um, you know, part of the discussion that comes up around these things is, um, is, is aren't we already on this course now um, in that, you know, that some of the decisions that we talked about that, and we saw how that happened historically, that it, it was uh, first the right to refuse treatment, then the right to, um, to withhold um, life support, those kinds of things. So we move from, you know, we move from what are passive measures like refusing treatment to active measures um, such as um, discontinuing life support or, or um, 
or that kind of thing. And then again, having, having recently experienced the death of a family member um, where he was being uh, treated for pain, at the same time that he was having respiratory issues in the end stage of, of his life and was on oxygen, and, you know, and again, this has been written about pretty clearly that when we're using major uh, narcotics, those suppress breathing. So at some point, you know, and, and different articles I've read, whatever, say, well, maybe it's a day or two or, you know, we're treating that pain, but at some point that, that treatment of pain, of pain suppresses, suppresses breathing and, you know, and that could be said that it hastens death. Okay, we have two more polling questions and then we really want to at, open up the chat box to all of you because uh, we're in good shape here with time. We have um, 25 or 35 minutes left um, or thereabouts. And uh, do you feel your beliefs about suicide prevention will come into conflict with question two? Yes or no? Question two is the Massachusetts prescribing medication to end life that is the ballot initiative that is up be before the Massachusetts voters in a couple of weeks, okay? So uh, for those of you who are still answering the poll and have answered the poll, about 67% of us, two-thirds, uh, do not believe our beliefs uh, will come into this conflict. Thank you. And then the next question, the last question we have um, for polling, do you think you will experience a conflict between your personal values and your professional experience on question two? Yes or no? Do you think you will experience a conflict between your personal values, and we've talked about many of those um, here today, and your professional experience on question two? So, you know, one of the things um, we see almost 80% 80, 80 um, saying that no, they don't believe it will, about 20% saying yes. One of the things that, you know, that um, we should emphasize is that, it, that the Massachusetts law is very clear that it's voluntary on the part of the health care provider and even builds in sanctions um, so that let's say, for instance, a, uh, a Catholic hospital the Catholic Church has taken a position against this, um, that it, it doesn't allow a provider working in a, a circumstance where their employer has said that they're opposed to this to go ahead and do it on their own. So, um, so for the most part, people will be able to, um, to choose whether they participate as a health care provider or not. And we have a question here, Ken, that if a person has been adjudicated as not competent, can a guardian make this end-of-life decision on that person's behalf? Um, I don't believe that there's any provision for that um, in, the, um, in, this, in this legislation currently, um, but that's a great, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then another, um, yes, and some of these questions we've heard from some of you uh, that these yes or no questions make it a little bit difficult because it might be maybe. <laughs> Um, and we didn't include a maybe, uh, we forced the point, but um, we, do re we do respect the fact there's a lot of gray area here uh, with question two and these death with dignity issues. And, and thank you for that comment. I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that I, I thought was, um, was profound for me when I presented this earlier this year was that um, at the end somebody walked up to me and said, well, I came into the room knowing pretty clearly how I thought I felt about this issue, and I leave really um, not knowing. And, um, and I think that, um, that, that what I liked about that statement was that it, these are really complex issues. And as we've em emphasized, complex in terms of our personal beliefs, in terms of our um, cultural and religious beliefs and backgrounds, complex in terms of our code of ethics and um, and the relationships that we have maybe um, as healthcare providers and also as family members. So they're not, um, they're not easy black and white um, answers to some of these things. So Ken, what if um, we have Catholic hospitals um, or other Christian-based hospitals? Can those hospitals forbid this 
act? Can they forbid the, the, the sanctioning of this act if it was approved? Yes, my understanding under the law is that that, that would allow a facility or an employer to, um, to say that no one in that um, facility is going to participate and that they would be subject to um, to sanctions if they uh, if they did go ahead and participate. And um, in Oregon and Washington, uh, since these are the two states that have legislated death with dignity, are there any guidelines about unused medications? Um, not that I'm aware of. It's a it's a great question, particularly in terms of um, lethal means restriction, um, and maybe something worth following up in terms of. Uh, if the law were to pass, how it gets put into practice that, you know, that family members be advised that, you know, that they should dispose of any medications after a person's death and the importance um, of that. And we've talked about the two witnesses needing to be present to the request by the patient, and one of those needs to be a non-family member. Could the treating physician be the second witness? I don't believe that that's so. I think it has to be somebody other than the... Um, than the, than, the, than the treating professional. I agree with that. I um, Ken, that is actually correct. Um, the patient's attending physician cannot serve as a witness. Thank you, Brandy. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had a question about the actual medicine that is prescribed under this law. And I think that's way beyond our purview. Yeah. And for lethal means restriction, I don't think we'd want to say it anyway. Um, we have our our colleague from Harvard who practice lethal means restriction and research it, and so we definitely, uh, we don't know what that actual medicine is. Um, but suffice it to say that it, it uh, would end someone's life um, with, within the guidelines that we talked about. Um, okay, so second off. Okay. Oh, the commercials in Massachusetts. Okay. See, we're not getting those commercials up in New Hampshire. I wish we were because we could stay tuned to more of what is happening. Is there a lot of um, is there is there a lot of um, is there a lot of media um, that is being devoted to this issue in Massachusetts? A lot of TV ads. Yep. And, and what I hear is that uh, there, there are a lot of these ads that are uh, not in favor of um, question two. Yep, that's what a number of you are indicating. So I, you know, I, I think suffice it to say that from both sides that you, know, that you have to be careful what you're, what you're hearing or what you're reading and that it's really important to the extent that you can that you learn as much as you can, um, you know, for yourself about some of these things, and that um, as with any issue that's a sensitive issue, that it's very easy, easy for things to be exaggerated or sort of extreme polarizing views to be expressed. And certainly um, Christian-based religions and Catholicism are opposing this. Um, do we think that this will possibly uh, pave the way to normalize euthanasia so that people no longer uh, try to check for or um, evaluate for depression in older adults or other terminally ill folks? I, you know, I, I think that my answer to that would be that, um, that no, there's, there's no evidence um, of that happening in um, Oregon and Washington. And if anything, I think that there may be the possibility that, that this law would open up conversations that would um, Make healthcare providers more sensitive to screening for depression in folks with terminal illnesses. Um, we certainly know that the co-occurrence of depression in illnesses like diabetes, cancer, heart disease uh, range from 30% on up, and and uh, that's an important part of uh, of what we know now about physical illnesses, and it, it isn't always necessarily screened for or discussed. So perhaps this uh, opens the door for conversations that primary care providers might have about a person's quality of life, and, and it might offer the opportunity for suicide prevention even 
that, you know, that hasn't been there before if the person discloses when asked that they have been thinking about suicide or thinking about wanting to, attempt to, um, to end their life. Um, and if the person cannot swallow pills, are there alternatives? Because certainly the pills are the ones that have been showed on the Massachusetts ads. Well, I, you know, I believe that, that, that that's the case, and I, and I think that, but, you know, these are some things that are still a little bit unclear. Um, the person has to be able to administer the, um, the, the dose themselves. And, you know, and, and that's an important part of the law. So one of the, you know, the, the conversations, questions that came up before was, well, what if the person is, you know, physically unable to, um, to administer the pills? Is there another way that that can be done? And I'm assuming that, you know, that some of what we saw with uh, Dr. Kevorkian was that there were um, a number of methods that could be, um, created for a person that wasn't necessarily capable of, um, of, of taking medications themselves as a way of ending their life. Um, many um, statewide and national um, suicide prevention um, organizations and coalitions have taken a no position policy on death with dignity laws. Um, and as we've researched this topic, Ken, um, um, in responding to the Massachusetts Initiative, have we learned anything that would help um, suicide prevention folks form a definitive position on assist unassisted suicide? Well, I, I think that that's a, um, that's a, that's a great question. And, and AAS is the American Association of Suicidology. Um, and I, I think that, that from the perspective of an organizational standpoint, and I would just speak for NAMI, but I think that probably um, that uh, MassDPH would also feel the same way. These are individual issues, and, you know, there's a reason that, this, that the legislature even um, passed on this and decided to let it go to um, a ballot question. It's because there are very personal and individual perspectives on that, and so there, you know, there may be some things that um, that it's important to not take a position on. And I think, you know, as an organization in that regard that, um, you know, that this is, this is one of those positions where um, it is a personal decision and it depends uh, from individual to individual. I'm sure that our membership as an organization would have um, very different opinions um, among the members about, um, about how they feel about this, you know. And so I'm sure other organizations likewise would, um, would find that diversity of thought and diversity of opinion, and it's hard to, um, to be respectful of those things as an organization if you take a, a position one way or another around it. And I've got to say that when, uh, when we introduced this to our staff that we were going to be facilitating uh, this webinar, our staff asked us the same thing. Well, what what is your position or what is NAMI's position? And frankly, looking at the pros and the cons of this, I'd really have to think long and hard about this if I were the Massachusetts voter. I really don't know right now um, fully. That's why I appreciate folks saying that it was a maybe, <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no, uh, because I'd really um, have to be very reflective on it um, prior to entering that voting booth. Um, so uh, commercials have begun, uh, the commercials in Massachusetts have begun, uh, one's from the AMA, AMA one's from a pharmacist, um, uh, some are opposing. Um, there are concerns that others in the individual uh, who are not the person with, terminal, uh, person with terminal illness might have access to the medications. Um, that's a great question around lethal means. Um, and thank you for that. Um, and it, you know, it, it may be something that you know that maybe suicide prevention organizations or other organizations in Massachusetts want to be involved with if this law, uh, if this referendum passes and comes into law, then um, you know maybe developing some type of brochure or something to be handed out to. Um, you know, folks that, that are talking to their physicians about this around restricting access to lethal means, around some of these other issues, or even 
you know, uh, suicide prevention hotlines, other kinds of information uh, might be some action that people want to take. Okay, Samantha, I'll get to your question. I'm just getting down um, through some of the other chat questions here. Great question asking, does someone have to be with a patient when they take the medication? Um, I believe that that's the case, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, what, what is said is that the person self-administers it. So, I mean, really the reality is that, that once, that they have, once they've done that with their, um, with their doctor, that, you know, that they're free to do it at a, at a place and time that they would like to do it. Um, I've just read a book called Final Gifts about people... Um, dying and you know and one of the things that it describes is that while many people and most people want to be with loved ones and want loved ones present that some people um, clearly choose to die when there aren't isn't anyone present and they're very private people and sort of anecdotal stories about gee you know the person left the room for for two minutes um, to go grab a cup of tea and you know and came back and the person had died so um, so I, I don't believe that somebody does have to be there. I think that that's part of that self-determination piece. Do we know if there have been any cases in Oregon or Washington where a person who took the steps to end their life but did not die? In other words, they took the medication and did not die. No, we do not know that. Okay, keep your chats coming in. We're going on because we, we have only three resource slides left for you because uh, we're at the end of our content for you. Uh, do we think that this practice will further stigmatize suicide and mental health because this law approves ending one's life when they have a terminal illness when some argue that other mental illnesses could be viewed as the same if the result is suicide? Well, you know, that, that is a, um, a complex question, and um, I believe that, that one of the states, either Washington or Oregon, specifically stated that mental illness is not considered a terminal illness under, under this law. Um, and, you know, and Massachusetts addresses that by saying that the person um, has to demonstrate that they're um, competent and capable of, of making um, a medical decision. I think that for the most part, um, the general public recognizes that this is really about an end of life issue, that, um, that given the parameters, and again, there's a lot of discussion about this, well, how can you know when somebody within, is within six months of, you know, of being terminally ill? Um, but the, the parameters of the law are that it is very focused on the last six months of a person's life, and that the person has to have a terminal illness, and it's not, so it doesn't, it's really in, in some ways very separate from um, the whole question about suicide for somebody that isn't terminally ill or isn't near the end of their life. And I think that uh, most of the discussion and the articles that I've read really focus in on that. Um, so we have um, a statement that the medication has to be self-administered uh, so that the only option would be pills. Um, and therefore, it's not technically physician-assisted, um, only in the sense that physicians need to, uh, they're prescribing the medication Correct. for the ending of one's life. Is the ballot question non-binding? Um, no, I believe it's, it's a binding um, ballot initiative and that, um, that there were certain thresholds that needed to be met when they were collecting signatures and, you know, and they met the, you know, one of the thresholds would have been that it was a non-binding question in terms of number of signatures that were certified, but they met the threshold for the number of signatures um, certified for it to be a binding referendum. So, you know, one of the things that I think is a challenge with this um, piece of legislation, or excuse me, this referendum question is that I believe that it goes into effect uh, January 1st, which is a pretty short period of time um, to get practices in place if the will of the voters is to enact this binding question. Yes. Um, we have 30 minutes left, and um, someone's asked about organ donation. If someone has this option, they choose this option, could they still, um, could they still offer up their organs? Um, great question, and, and I don't know the answer to that. I think that, um, you know, I'm assuming that given, given, the, um, 
given the toxology involved in terms of that it's an overdose issue, that, um, that those organs might be somehow, um, or some of the organs, liver, kidneys, whatever, might be compromised and might not be available for, um, for uh, transplant. Yes, and the Massachusetts brochure that is being referred to is actually what is the guidelines of the law in that um, someone is advised to have someone else present and that they not do it in a public place. So that is actually something that is recommended by uh, Massachusetts, the, the outline for question number two. Uh, let's see. Um, so, uh, oh, great question. I'm not sure. I know, uh, boy, I wish Alan could chime in on this one um, or other folks. What entity introduced the question in Massachusetts? Well, there, there was an organization. I, uh, I forget what the actual name of it was. Um, although I think it had, um, I think it um, was something to do with um, death with dignity, um, and they were the ones that um, that I believe were the ones that that initiated the um, the signatures and the uh, ballot question. Brandy, if you know that question, you could certainly chime in. I don't know if anybody else uh, would know that question about uh, what entity. Um, started this initiative or introduced this question? I don't know off the top of my head. I do not know the organization name. Okay. Yeah. We do know that uh, uh, they had to go through, as Ken referred to earlier, a number of um, obtaining enough questions to further initiative forward. And they met all the criteria to get to this point um, for the voters of Massachusetts to um, then decide whether or not they would want this. Um, this says that the main supporters of the measure include the Massachusetts Death with Dignity Coalition, and I and I believe that they may have been the ones that um, that collected the signatures. It says referred by under the the um, you know a, a fact thing. So. Um. Okay. So. Um, just to get to our closing view, um, and the next three slides are resource slides, so that if you're more interested on question two on slide 40, and all of you will receive a copy of this, um, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and so people can access it if they're not on the call, but certainly if you are, you, have, uh, you will have these materials. Um, on slide 40, we will have other resources there if you want to um, tune in to other places or other uh, forums, video forums, about question two. Those are on slide 40. So we, Ken and I really just want to point up that obviously this issue of suicide and death with dignity, um, they're complex issues. And they have powerful legal, ethical implications. and um, even though it's the decision of, a, of an individual who is faced with um, terminal illness and living for six months, um, uh, you know, the, it, it's a, it's, it does affect family. It does affect others around that individual. Um, and certainly for any one of us that is thinking about suicide or feeling suicidal, we do need to turn to uh, a trusted colleague or uh, friend or family member to disclose this. Any other questions or um, somebody's indicated that this webinar was nice to have some clarification surrounding this issue. We hope we helped to do that with some of the uh, concrete information, but certainly uh, we appreciate that we may have introduced more questions um, than solidified folks' stance on this on this uh, position. Um, okay, so we think, uh, so we have a curiosity question about the Medicare money, uh, wondering if 25% of the Medicare is spent in the last year of life and 9% in the last month. 
Well, as I said that you know, when I presented that slide that there are different um, there's a lot of different statistics that are available about that and I um, wasn't presenting that as the be all end all. If you know if you have a source that says um, says that, then that may be right as well. But the point was the point that I was trying to make was that part of that argument is about the significant amount of health care costs that go into the last um, days, weeks, and months of somebody's life. Okay, so um, uh, going into just a resource slide um, because the Samaritans are a very big resource and a valued resource in Massachusetts. So here is the Samaritan statewide hotline on 39, slide 39. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the Trevor Helpline for Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, Questioning Youth um, and Adults, and also uh, the other Samaritans in Massachusetts to include our listeners today, our participants today from Merrimack Valley. You will see on slide 40, uh, this is the additional information for question 2, uh, certainly through New York Times and and some other um, uh, re, uh, resources that were provided to us from the Department of Public Health. And on 41, our last slide is our contact information. Um, and certainly, if um, we do, we do believe that this is uh, can be an emotional issue depending on where people are hailing from or coming from with regard to their personal experiences. So please seek out any kind of um, assistance from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or from Samaritans um, if any of this content has um, been, to, uh, been of an emotional nature uh, for you. Uh, can pharmacists opt out of filling these prescriptions and would Medicaid or Medicare cover end-of-life treatment? Um, I don't know that um I don't know that it will be clear to pharmacists when they're, when they're um, fulfilling a prescription that it will be an end of life um, script, but um, that's a good question and I would assume that if, um, that if it is clear that yes, they could opt out under the law because the law is very clear that it's, you know, that it's voluntary. Um, in Worcester County, um, one of the resources is Community Health Link, the Emergency Services Program. Um, the 1-800-977-5555 for emergency mental health assistance. Um, uh, as our chairperson has said to all, you will receive a link for this recorded webinar. Um, any other chat box questions or comments? We have about 20 minutes left. Um, we did really want to get through in a timely manner and, and try not to take all of the time, but it's a little bit difficult when you're interacting with folks um, only via the written word. Um, and I think it's been great. It's been a real challenge for multitasking um, in terms of all the comments and questions that people have, um, that people have referenced. Um, I'm going to go back and I'll go back one slide uh, for the resources. Here's additional information on question two. Um, we do have a question, is NAMI New Hampshire taking a stance on question two? We are not, and nor is the Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention in Massachusetts. Um, I think Ken's point was, our parents and uh, our parents who are living with family members with mental illness certainly would come at this issue from a different stance. I think when you mentioned that from what our members, uh, their stance would be. Um, well, it's, again, it's just a diversity of opinion. Of opinion. I mean, it, it doesn't, obviously for us as an organization, NAMI New Hampshire, um, we're, we're uh, we're not operating in the, in the state where the ballot's taking place, but for the other mass organizations, I think a number of them have chose not to take a formal position for this, recognizing that their you know their individual members or um, service providers or other organizations um, have diverse points of view. 
Um, we too appreciate opening, uh, um, Samantha has thanked us for opening this up to professionals out of Massachusetts. We do thank um, Department of Public Health for making this available. We tried uh, to, we waited till um, just a few days before this webinar, um, respecting that ma this was a Massachusetts um, uh, ballot referendum, but um, we were able to open it up to uh, New Hampshire as well as uh, the listserv across the country, um, certainly via suicide prevention, and we agree. Um, and for you in Tennessee, this is a discussion that um, we do believe is a healthy discussion, especially for those of us who work in the field of suicide prevention, um, for us to be having uh, this discussion. So thank you from Tennessee. So a couple more questions here. Um, one, that it seems like officially sanctioned suicide in the last six months might lead some people struggling with challenging but non-terminal illness to give more serious consideration, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem like a good outcome of the law. Um, and I guess that's really a statement, uh, not a question. Uh, another question following, um, big picture question, if the measure passes in Massachusetts, do you see this as having a national impact and why? Um, and, you know, sure, as Massachusetts goes, so goes the nation. And mm. because you can't see me, I'm winking. Um, <laughs> no, but seriously, um, I think that um, I, I would say that yes. I mean, I think that it was um, it was over 10 years between um, you know between when Oregon passed this, uh, close to 15 years, and Washington State passed it. Maine, I believe, had a ballot question two or three years ago that lost. It was very close. I think it was. 51% to 49%. So, um, so and, a, and a number of other states have had legislation and or ballot questions. And I think it, at some point, um, you know, the, um, as people experience this and are able to show some statistics and research and, you know, and impact on it, um, I, I think that if Massachusetts votes no, um, then, you know, that might quiet things for a while in, you know, in some areas where, um, given that Massachusetts tends to be a fairly liberal state, that, um, that people would feel like it, it may not be um, something that's worth pursuing at this point in time. If Massachusetts votes yes, then I think that you will see people in other states feeling like, who are very passionate about this issue, that they want to have their choice for their family member or their loved one, um, they may pursue uh, ballot initiatives in their states as well. So 45 different phone lines were used in this webinar, but certainly as we found out um, from our folks at EDC, um, that the entire departments were involved, which was just um, quite the thrill for Ken and I. Thank you. Um, the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention had an interesting session at its national conference last week on ro what role they should take on this question up there. They had a panel of ethicists and palliative care experts. Very interesting. You might want to contact former CASP president, Adrian Hill, who's behind that. Wonderful. Um, a question is, uh, and thank you for that, um, for our, our neighboring country to the north. Um, do you have to take the med medications in Massachusetts or ones prescribed wherever you feel best? Well, I, I think that, again, um, I think the intention is that it would be taken in Massachusetts, but once that prescription is given, I don't think that they necessarily have control over that. I think that the other consideration, though, is if the, um, if the medications are taken elsewhere, it's likely that the birth certificate would not necessarily indicate that the cause of death was um, related to that person's terminal illness, which may be very important for that person or their family, an important consideration. Another important point is, um, and thank you for this, someone's pointing out the cultural differences um, in terms of population and diversity between Oregon and Massachusetts, um, and it does make it difficult, you're right that Massachusetts will have similar outcomes to Oregon with regard to the impact this act will have on suicide attempts. Any thoughts? Thank you for pointing out cultural differences. Well, again, I mean, I, I think, um, 
I think first of all, one of the things that I've not, and you know, I've read a lot on this subject, I've not seen anything that really ties um, suicide attempts in Oregon or Washington to the bill. And I think that that question has been raised, um, and that's not to say that it, it may not, it's to say that we don't know or it's not been um, thoroughly researched. So, um, so I think that that is an important, um, important piece. Um, and I think it's, it's hard to, dis, you know, it's hard to, I think as you point out, to say, will, will there be similar outcomes in Oregon as there are in Massachusetts? I guess, you know, my feeling would be similar in the sense that the laws are very similar. The, the time frame, some of the requirements of the law, um, you know, they're, they're uh, very restrictive in that sense. And so in, in, in that regard, I would expect that, that some of the outcomes would be similar. Um. And we do have a link to the Canada session, um, but only the chairperson could put that up for everybody. So, um, uh, but it would be whichtools.wordpress.com, whichtools, W-H-I-C-H-T-O-O-L-S, dot wordpress.com. Um, so we, we have the belief that it's two separate issues as far as impact on suicide attempts, meaning one population, people with mental illness, and the other population, people with terminal illness. And that, you know, that's, that's an important point as well. Right, right. Great questions and comments. Keep them coming if there's, if there's others. Or, yes. We have any other folks that want to weigh in um, in the chat box. Um, while we have some downtime, Ken and I really want to thank all of you, um, including DPH, uh, for this opportunity to facilitate this webinar. It certainly keeps us on our toes in working in the field of suicide prevention. Um, and um, it really has been an honor to be part of this, and we really are uh, anxiously awaiting what that boat uh, will look like in Massachusetts. So we have um, we have a um, a statement thinking that it. Uh, will not increase the overall suicide rate. Um, and she appreciated that um, just because the, um, the, you have the amount of people that filled the prescription um, did not mean they necessarily took the medication. And I guess that's why I think it's so important to look at the lessons learned from Oregon and Washington. Even though we did have this individual who mentioned that culturally Oregon is different from Massachusetts and vice versa, the lesson learned out of Oregon was that it was just the option. It was the choice. It was having that choice um, um, and the comfort of that choice, but that people didn't, didn't necessarily exercise that choice to end their life. And I would remind people, since so many people indicated that they were involved with a family member, that you know, there are many, um, there are many um, pieces here along the timeline as, as we move towards end, end of life issues in terms of having conversations with your loved ones about death and about dying and about you know, quality of life and end of life issues. And um, the, the opportunity to develop a living will, to give advanced medical care directives, um, those kinds of things and to have those conversations really empowers people. Um, I, I, we don't talk a lot about death in our society and I think people aren't familiar with death. We don't witness death. We don't, you know, it, it's really hidden away. And I think when people um, understand that, you know, that pain can be, um, can be mitigated, that death tends to often be very peaceful, that, you know, that they can have some control through advanced medical directives and through having conversations with family members and loved ones, that that's an important um, part of the process 
for any of us to think about whether it's with um, people that we're serving in a professional capacity or with our own family members. Right, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Ken, because I, I remember early on in this webinar we talked about how many people on the call actually had a living will and it was a high proportion who did not have a living will. So we hope that we've given a lot of information um, to these issues that people perhaps uh, think differently um, or uh, take, uh, take measures in advance for themselves or for their family members. And again, a special thank you to, um, to Brandy Brooks for being our host and our facil facilitator. Um, did a great job helping us get this prepared and set up. So thank you, Brandy. No small feat with the dinosaurs we are in technology. So yes, <laughs> kudos to that. You are more than welcome. <laughs> All right, well, I, it looks like that's it. So thank you all very much, and um, certainly hope that you will um, engage in further discussions around this with your colleagues and with your um, family member and friends. And um, certainly, whichever side you're on, please get out and vote on, um, on November 6th. Yes, and thank you. Uh, we will uh, hopefully, Massachusetts, we want to let you know that uh, the eyes of the nation are certainly on you with respect to uh, question two. And thank you to all people uh, today here in New England as well as outside of New England who participated in this webinar today. It's near and dear to our hearts. Thank you. Um, yes, and just to parrot um, Ken and Ann, I'd like to thank them for presenting this afternoon. And as well, thank you all for participating in this webinar. Uh, as mentioned several times, everyone who participated today will receive a follow-up email that will contain a link to today's recorded webinar. Um, in addition, please be on the lookout for our emails about upcoming webinars and trainings uh, being sponsored by DPH. After you log off today, please take a few moments to complete the webinar evaluation uh, because we do use that in terms of creating future webinars. And just to again reiterate, Ken and Ann, I hope that you've gained a little bit more knowledge about uh, question number two, prescribing medication to end life. And again, thank you all for participating, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.